Welcome to I Rise Conversations with Joan. Welcome to I Rise Conversations with Joan. My name is Joan Wosu, and I'm the award-winning author of the book, I Rise, The 10 Secrets to Getting Up When Life Knocks You Down. So they say, when life throws you lemons, you can choose to do nothing because you just don't like lemons, or you can choose to make lemonade out of it, or you can send it right back and go after what you truly want. The truth is we all have the same number of hours in a day. So why are some people able to achieve more? The results you have in your life today are a reflection of the decisions you have made in your past, which means that there is hope for a better future. Today, we will explore how you can choose a different path and create the reality that you truly desire. Our amazing phenomenal guest today is Frank McKinney. He is a true modern day Renaissance man who has pushed the limits of success in every endeavor in his life. His life is a testament to the power of aspiration to create a completely new reality. He's a real estate artist using his maverick approach. He's a philanthropic capitalist, I've never heard that word before, who has built many self-sustaining villages with homes, schools, clinics, community centers, churches, renewable food, clean water, and a means for people to support themselves. He's also a seven-time best-selling author. He's an actor. He's a keynote speaker. He's written seven books in six genres. He has starred in two movies and he's keynoted before audiences from 10 to 10,000 around the world. He has also pushed the limit of his body by racing in the Badwater Ultra Marathon 12 times. Talk about accomplishments. Welcome, Frank, to the show. Wow. You know, I've had this on my calendar for like four months because I know how hard it is to get into your calendar. And so I, I'm super excited. I'm coming to you and your viewers today from my oceanfront treehouse office. That's why you see like the trees in the background over my shoulder. I, I actually work in a treehouse. I wrote all my books in the treehouse. And today we're doing your fantastic i rise show from the treehouse amazing i wish i could be there physically but yeah it looks amazing <laughs> thank, you. thank you for being here okay so before we jump right into six all the amazing things that you've done tell us a little bit about your experience like growing up where did you all start from because your story is truly a grass to grace experience i've never heard that before grass to grace that is beautiful <laughs> If you don't mind, I will borrow that. Uh, yeah, the grass grew in Indiana on a farm where I was born, just a corn fed country boy, oldest of six. My mother worked at a school until she started having a lot of babies. My father worked as a teller at a bank. I went to four high schools in four years. Uh, and it wasn't because my dad was in the military, <laughs> it was because I was asked to leave all three of them before I finally graduated from the fourth with a 1.8 GPA. I actually spent seven different stints, seven different times in juvenile detention before I was 18. So at 18, I took out the kind of the imaginary eraser of life. Let's imagine this is the eraser. And I turned around to the chalkboard of life and I erased what was, which was that kind of juvenile delinquent troublemaking youth. I got on a plane with a one-way plane ticket out of Indiana. I'm very proud of my Midwest roots. I say I met, I left the Midwest, but the Midwest never left me. I landed in Palm Beach, Florida, big culture shock going from a small town in Indiana to Palm Beach. Uh, And I started to pursue subconsciously, subliminally, I didn't know what it was then, my professional highest calling, which we'll talk a little bit about. And then ultimately my spiritual highest calling, because everyone needs to kind of try to dovetail the two, your professional or spiritual, spiritual highest calling. So you know, I, I'm, I'm just a simpleton saved by the grace of God, really sinners saved by the grace of God. And, um, and, and I think that, you know, the people that, that subscribe to your program and read your book, I have a lot in common with them. So I'm, I'm really eager to share, you know, in these 45 minutes, some of that story. Absolutely. So like, it's so amazing because again, this is a case of life through you lemons, 1.8 GPA, seven stints in juvenile detention for some people. That's it. That will be the excuse for the rest of your life. Why life life just conspired against me. Couldn't do anything. It's not my fault. That's it. I just stay there in victim mode. So what inspired you to buy that one way ticket and head to Florida? My most recent book came out. It's called Aspire, how to create your own reality and alter your DNA. And 
you know, it's my first mindset book. I've written six different genres and I won't bother you with what they are, but this is the first time I've delved into the mindset. And I really went back almost a post-mortem, even though I'm not dead yet, on that thought process of really killing the person I was born to be, to become the person I wanted to be. And when I say that, it's pretty violent. You know, it's, it's actually kind of, you know, aggressive uh, graphic. And I was born to be one of two things, Joan. I was born to be a criminal, probably, with my juvenile delinquent behavior or a banker because my father was a banker. My grandfather was a banker. I didn't want to be either one of those things. So I killed the person I was born to be when I got on that plane and landed in Florida. And that evolution really over the last many, many years living in South Florida, um, I was able to, as I, and I'm just going to put this up maybe once or twice, but I was able to do, as the subtitle says, I was able to create my own reality. And in turn, I altered my DNA. I was altered. I altered the DNA I was born with who I was born to be. A lot of people are happy with who they were born to be, but what if you're not, Hmm. you know, and, and if you really think about it, you look, go in the mirror tonight, if you listen to your program and am I happy with what I was born to be? And it's not too late to kill the person you were born to be, to become what you want to be. And that's exactly what I did when I got on that plane Hmm. out of Indiana. I needed a change of venue. I needed a change of scenery. I just wasn't making it. My mother was turning prematurely gray. I mean, I was putting people through a lot of heartache. And it was enough, you know, enough on me, especially enough on them. And and landing in South Florida, the land of opportunity, really, it was a beautiful new fresh start for me. I got to take out that eraser and just and the chalk actually now and start to to scribe, start to write my the life uh, that I really wanted to live. Yeah, and I th- I think it's really brilliant this the way you simplify it. Just look in the mirror because we all know deep down inside whether or not we're happy with the life that we're currently living. So take a look in the mirror and really ask yourself, am I happy with the life that I was created to have? The one that the family you grew up in, the environment where you live in, where you've always lived, you lived in the same house all your life, you've done the same job. Am I happy? And if you're not, maybe it's time to move. For you, it was physically getting on the plane and moving. And maybe that's what some people need to do. You You know, it doesn't doesn't have to be physical. It just, it can be metaphorical. You know, it it really, in the first section of of my book, Aspire, I talk about the difference between motivation, inspiration, and aspiration. And there's a reason I entitled my book, Aspire, not Inspire or Motivate. I learned at an early age, Joan, that motivation washes off and goes down the drain with the soap at night. I mean, you think about it, you read a motivational quote or you watch, you know, you, you, you watch a program that's motivating. But by the time you go take a shower, most of that motivation just just kind of washes off and goes down the drain with the with the soap. That's why there's a multi-billion dollar industry built around motivation, because the smart people know we can't hang on to vitamin M. We can't hi- hang on to motivation. Inspiration lasts about as long as a bad sunburn. So if you've been out in the sun, you burnt, you know, two weeks later, a week and a half later, whatever, you're, you're back to normal. Well, that's kind of what happens when you, you know, watch a inspirational movie or maybe read an inspirational book. You know, it does eventually wear off. What I've found is that aspiration, this almost otherworldly burning passion for your purpose, this this desire to um, it's kind of like a Fabergé egg or, 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 or a very special box. It's this this jewel gem of a box where that that otherworldly burning passion for your purpose. And and I aspire like you. You can lose motivation sometime. Oh, yeah. I wanted to be a best-selling author, and yet I come out of school with a 1.8 GPA. There was times I was not motivated or inspired to write, you know, my first book, let alone seven books in six, six genres. So don't beat yourself up over the fact that you can't stay motivated or inspired. What I'm encouraging you to do is find these aspirational endeavors, the things that are so sacred that you you put them on that shelf. And every day, even though you're not motivated and inspired, you never lose sight of those aspirations. And in my life, Joan, I've only had a handful. And some of them took 25 years to attain. But I never lost sight of those aspirational goals and dreams of mine. Wow. That, that like, I've never heard anybody differentiate all three that way. Um, but, but yeah, finding your purpose and having that aspiration is what keeps you going. So even when the going gets tough, when you lose all form of motivation, as we all do, 
you keep going because you know what your purpose is. And I know some people, listeners might be saying, well, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't. There's so many ways to discover your purpose today. But all in all, at the end of the day, we always know deep down inside when there's more, when there's something missing, when you know that you should be doing something different. So maybe just start by sitting with yourself, asking yourself those true questions. Am I happy? Is this what I want? When I think about my life and how beautiful it can be, is this, am I living it today? And if it's not, then start aspiring to do better and really have a, a focus, a goal where you're headed. So it might take you 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You know, it's never too late because some people might say, oh, but I'm too old now. No, it's never too late to get on this journey. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be happy you did. So for you, Frank, how did you, first of all, what is real estate artistry? So I, you know, I might look like I play in a band. I, I, I cannot paint. I cannot sculpt. I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. But, but Joan, I always wanted to be an artist of some kind. And so when I came to Florida, I didn't start out in real estate. I was a maintenance worker and then on a golf course. And then from there, I was a tennis instructor where I taught a lot of very wealthy people how to hit a forehand and a backhand. And they taught me the way to the fortune that they made was through real estate. And when I was, I was on that tennis court for, you know, 10 hours a day. And at the end of every lesson, I would ask the students, these were adults, you know, older adults. I was in my early twenties. How'd you get here? And what I learned was, was real estate. So in my early twenties, I took all the money I'd saved from teaching tennis. And contrary to what you might see in front of you, I'm a lot less exciting than I look. I saved my money. I swore off all unhealthy vices and temptations, no drinking, no smoking, no gambling, no overeating, no oversleeping. I mean, my wife calls me a nerd in sheep's clothing. He's not as exciting as he looks. And I followed the advice of my tennis students and I bought a crack house in a really bad part of town uh, for $36,000 that I had saved teaching tennis. And my, my aspiration in the moment, I remember when I bought that was I was going to make it the nicest crack house on the block. It wasn't a crack house anymore, but I was going to make it beautiful. And in that moment, I became a real estate artist where, you know, too many people approach their professional highest calling with the bottom line in mind. And I say, sacrifice your bottom line to build your reputation, build your re reputation first and the bottom line will follow. Yeah. What that also translates to is early on, I sacrificed margin, meaning I made less money per house so I could build my reputation. And when I was, when I was renovating those crack houses in the in really rough neighborhoods for the first five years of my career, my real estate career, I did not buy, renovate and sell a house worth more than a hundred thousand dollars. These were first time home buyer homes in really rough neighborhoods. But you know what? I got really good at the craft of real estate, not the business, but the craft of real estate. And so I encourage people, regardless of your line of work, approach it like an artist would. Mm -hmm. So would an artist walk into a paint store, say he's a painter, and would he buy the cheapest paintbrush and the cheapest palette, you know, and the cheapest paint? It, it would, would he you know, like I would put three coats of paint on a wall instead of one? I would put new grass sod out instead of just grass seed. I put a new roof on instead of just, you know, patching the old roof, a new mailbox. I used to leave the stickers on the appliances to let people know these are, brand, you know, the, the, the stickers that show they're new, the energy yeah. guide stickers, to let people know they're new. And I took that artist approach to, to my first $50,000 fixer upper. We did a bunch of houses worth less than 100 grand for that, that first five years. And then, Joan, I started, I jumped from, a hundred grand to $2.2 million. So what I do is I build houses on speculation. I do not build houses for, for a couple. I'm not a custom builder. I'm an artist. I'm, I'm like Van Gogh, Renoir, or Monet painting a painting, putting it on the wall and saying, it is now for sale. You know, it's my design, my wife and my, my design, it's my money, it's, you know, it's my risk. And then we put it up for sale. And, and since that first $2.2 million house, almost 30 years ago, We've done 44 direct oceanfront homes, built them on speculation, meaning we didn't have a buyer in mind, with the average selling price of around $14 million. I never would have got there had I not taken an artist approach to my craft. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. And I, I, I love, I think for me, the biggest thing, the biggest lesson that I learned from what you just, the story you just told us was reputation. Focus on building your reputation and the money, the bottom line will show up. It will follow. It will it's, follow. People do it in reverse, don't they? They, they focus yes. on the bottom yes. line, they cut corners and, you yep. know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not the way to build 
a legacy. And don't we all want to leave a legacy? We all want immortality. And that's how you, that's what a legacy really is. And we'll get to what I really think my legacy will be. It actually won't be the real estate. It's what we're doing over in Haiti for the last 20 years. But man, did it, it made going to work or it makes going to work for me every day exciting knowing I've got a brand, I got a blank canvas. Yeah. And my canvas really is the Atlantic Ocean. Like that's my, that, that beach, I point, point over my computer because the ocean's right there. That's my canvas, this blank canvas called the, the, the beachfront property in Palm Beach County. And every real estate project is different. And that keeps it interesting for me. And then when it sells, you know, we take a lot of the proceeds and we build these villages in Haiti, which we'll get to later. Okay. Awesome. So some people might be thinking now, okay, I want that life. I want to go into real estate, but this is not 20 years ago. You could not find a property for 50,000. You, you, you need so much capital. Those interest rates are so high. Is it too late to get into real estate? So first of all, depending on who, where you're listening to this, you can still buy uh, a house for 50,000. I was sitting in the waiting room. The reason I was late today at getting an MRI and I was watching this program on HGTV there, there, this is new. This is happening right now. There was, there was a couple guys renovation in, in rough part. They were buying houses for a thousand dollars in Detroit, a thousand dollars. Now they were rough. I mean, they were bad, <laughs> but they were putting like 50 grand into them and selling them for 80. They were making $30,000 a house. So mm. this is not my quote. It's Warren Buffett's quote, but real estate is the single greatest creator of wealth in the history of the world, certainly in the history of the United States. So. I, I learned this from these people I was teaching tennis to that were multi, multi-millionaires. So it's, it's never too late. I, one of my books is called Burst This, Frank McKinney's Bubble Proof Real Estate Strategy. And that basically takes the, a first-time, home, uh, first-time investor, mm-hmm. even a realtor, through the process of how to buy it right, renovate it right, make money on it in any market. I went back and studied six different real estate markets dating back to the mid-70s. To show that it doesn't matter what what are happening to interest rates, the inflation rate, all this negativity that permeates the airwaves, don't follow a market. Go out and make a market, and that's what I have done for thirty years. Like I tune all that stuff out. When everybody's walking out the exit door, they're running for the exits in panic. I'm calmly walking through the entrance and making a lot of money, you know, doing it. <laughs> which which is all what we're looking for. Okay, so. Again, a lot of people, because there's this myth around real estate, it's for people who are, who are already rich, but now we're hearing that it's possible to start with $1,000. The properties are out yes. there. You, there it. you know, listen, if, so for, this isn't real, a real estate program, but the bit, the, there's two pieces of real estate advice I would give. So if you're, you're listening and watching and you want to get into real estate, wherever you are, there are real estate investment clubs in almost every municipality, big and small. I mean, tiny markets, you might have to drive a little bit to go to one. I've spoken at a ton of them, you know, with my, when my books come out and I've been all over the country. I've, I've been to, they're all over the place. That is where if I were starting all over again, because those weren't around when I got started, Joan, I did not have the benefit of learning from a real estate investment club. Go to your, go Google it and find your local real estate investment club, go to the meeting, pay the $20 at the door. You don't even have to join, or, you know, if there's a membership, whatever, just pay the door, door charge and sit and listen. Sit and listen. Don't buy any of the programs they might be selling, you know, the, the whole, you know, get rich quick. Don't buy anything. No <laughs> Just network and listen. Yeah. That's the first thing. And the second is, you know, for, there, there's two segments of the real estate market place that are recession proof. And we may be entering a recession right now. The first time home buyer marketplace. So every municipality, every region has a first time home buyer range of price. In, in mine in South Florida, it might be 300 grand at the beginning, you know, at the low end. Wherever you are, it might be 100 grand. That part of the real estate marketplace is recession proof, as well as the ultra high end, which is where I sell now. Those two segments of the real estate marketplace have been recession proof since the Roman era. So don't think about the million dollar house and half a million. Go appeal to and appease and sell to that first time home buyer. I made a fortune for five years selling hundred thousand dollar houses so it's possible okay so th- thank you for that advice because i know that again controversial topic people say warren buffett says it's the safest uh, investment some people say no head to the stock market but again to each their own but i do believe that real estate is a good investment for anyone who wants to save for the future or even if you want to make money now 
Well, the, well, the good thing, last thing about the real, real estate is tangible. Real estate isn't going to go down in value overnight like a stock. Nobody's going to rip you off because it's sitting on the ground. They can't pick it up and put it in their pocket and steal it from you. And, and a tsunami. <laughs> unless there's a tsunami, but but you know there 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 could be a tsunami, you know, in, in anything in life. That's a good metaphor. Those things happen, but we can't we can't approach this with fear. We have to approach this with courage and boldness. And and when you have a piece of real estate, like I was always a buy and sell person, buy, add value, and sell. I'm a project specific person. Buy and hold is a great strategy. Buy your real estate, hold it, live in it for a while, rent it out, eventually sell it. There's so many ways storage airbnb i mean there's so many more ways to make money in real estate now so i encourage you to check it out okay awesome thank you so your one of your books is called make it big 49 secrets to building a life of extreme success 49 what will be your top one or top two secrets that you want to share today? i got two that are still that book came out 20 years ago it's still i mean it's still the best-selling book i've, I've written obviously because it's 20 years old but there are two that people continue to still write me about. One is, I don't remember what chapter it is. I'm sorry, but it's exercise your risk tolerance like a muscle. Mm. Exercise your risk threshold like a muscle. Eventually, it will become stronger and able to withstand greater pressure. One more time, exercise your risk tolerance, you know, your threshold for risk, like a muscle, eventually would become stronger and able to withstand greater pressure. I was not, I had not the education. I had not the, the funding. I had no friends, no, no network, no education, no nothing. But the one thing I understood from a very early age is regardless of if I was going to be like, I actually came to Florida to be a stunt man. And then I was going to be an actor. And I needed to take a risk. I needed to embrace risk. And, and the second section of Aspire breaks down in five chapters. The, 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 the section title is uh, risk equals uh, fear equals risk equals reward, um, uh, big change or big challenge. So let me break that down. When you think about taking a risk, the first thing that comes to mind is another four letter word called fear, fear. <laughs> The th and that risk is associated with a big change or a big challenge in your life, a financial, spiritual, relational, dietary. I mean, all these different challenges that you may choose to pursue. I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to pursue that big change or challenge. Well, then fear sets in, Joan. Yeah. What happens? What I've learned, it's the thought of taking a risk that induces fear. It's not the actual taking of the risk. Use a roller coaster as a metaphor. When you get on that roller coaster and that bar slams down across your waist, your heart is pounding out of your chest. You're terrified, but nothing's happened. You're still sitting in the car. You're just, maybe you're going up the hill, clickety clacking, and, and your heart's starting to pound even faster. You're ready to pass out. Nothing's happened. Yeah. It's the thought of what is about to happen that gets us afraid. Well, what happens for those of you who have ridden a roller coaster? What happens when you get to the top and you go over that first hill? <laughs> it, 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 it's joy. It's throwing our arms up in the yeah. air. It's just, this is the greatest thing. And most of us will get off the ride and go to the back right. and do it again. Yeah. That's how life goes. Once you get over the fear associated with the thought of taking a risk, that, bigger ch that big change or challenge will be right there at your fingertips. Most people succumb to the fear at the thought of taking a risk. Listen, Joan, I'm afraid every day of my life. I, there's no such thing as mastering risk or conquering risk. I listen to my risk, but when I, when I, when I, or my fear, I should say, mastering, mastering fear, or conquering fear. That fear is an indication I am on the right track because guess what? I'm experiencing fear, not because, you know, like a train's coming or yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. things that you're supposed to be afraid of. I'm talking about in life. You know, you want to go on a date. You want to ask somebody out. You want to start a new diet. You want to start going to church. You want to get into business for yourself. All those things say, I got to take a risk. Yeah. You know what that leads to? If you don't take the risk, you and I, Joan, you're younger than me, but there'll come a time when you and I are sitting on our, our front porch in our rocking chairs and we will look back and we will have regrets. It's inevitable. In life, you will have regrets. Mm -hmm. I'm from the camp that says, regret what you did. Not what you didn't do. 
Mm. I did a $50 million house on spec and there was a time when I wasn't sure it was going to sell. I would rather regret trying like that desert race. I've run 12 times. I've failed five of those 12. I've made it seven, but I don't want to be sitting with you in our rocking chair saying, man, I regret not trying that. I really regret not going on that, asking that girl on that date or starting that business or going to church or whatever. It's getting on that diet. That's the most important. That's a long answer to one chapter in make it big. Uh, I'm a, I, do you want the other one? We'll say the other one for when we talk about Haiti because okay, it, so let's, let's say the other one. But I love this one so much because fear really holds a lot. It stops people in their tracks and they're just not able to move forward. So I think just like he said, if you reprogram your mind to see fear to mean that you're in the right direction, and fear is just the thought; it's not the actual thing. Yes, and just just exercise that muscle every day because I think that the, people think that successful people are not afraid. No, the difference is they take action in spite of the fear. So, I will, I will be afraid every day of my life, but I will not let fear stop me. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So we'll keep moving in spite of the fear. Do not let your fear hold you in your track. You're on the right. You just said it, Joan, you're on the right track. When you're starting to feel fear. Yes. When, when you think about a big change or challenge, you are on the right track, push through it. Push through it. I love that. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about Haiti now, because I know that's something that you're really passionate about. What is a philanthropic capitalist? Okay. So good. That's the second chapter in Make It Big that is still one of the most popular. And it's been in, in one way, shape, or form, it's been in every single one of my books. Each one of us has been blessed with the ability to succeed, not for our own sole benefit, but in order to assist others who will likely not succeed at our level. That's one of the chapters in Make It Big. It's the second most impactful chapter. I'm a Christian. And in the Bible, there's a pa- don't let that turn you off. When I say the word <laughs> Bible, for those of you who are atheist, agnostic, Muslim, Hindu, Jew, it doesn't matter. Just hear me out. This is a great life mantra. Mm. To whom much is entrusted, much is required. To whom much is given, much is expected. It's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 48. That is a mantra I've lived by. I was given a lot, Joan, from that 1.8 GPA and the seven stints of juvenile detention to the real estate successes I I had experienced. And I realized at a very low point in my life, I mean, depression, um, I was very successful financially, but I had lost all the heart in my soul or all the soul in my heart. I was a consumerist. I was a materialist. It was all about putting more cars in my garage and clothes in my closet and food in my pantry. I went to my mentor and I said, his name was Rich. I said, Rich, Rich DeVos was my mentor. If you want to look him up, he's an amazing man. He passed away at 92 years old. Rich, why do I feel so terrible? Why do I feel like I'm on top of the world, yet I feel like I'm in hell? And he said, Frank, you found your professional highest calling. It's clear to me you haven't found your spiritual highest calling. So I, I went out, I said, he he goes, go out and, you know, try to to, to go to a soup kitchen, you know, start helping people less fortunate. I did that. I volunteered at the soup kitchen one hour a week for about a year. And I realized I had a lot in common with the homeless people I was serving. I actually had, I could relate to them as easily as leaving Donald Trump's office in Palm Beach one day. I remember leaving Trump's office back before he's president. This is when he was just a real estate guy. So no politics here. Mm -hmm. And then, and then coming down and serving meals, to homeless. And I thought, man, I have as much in common with with Trump as I do with the the homeless people. So our caring house project foundation, which is the name of our entity. That is a, I don't like to use the word charity. It's, it's, it's an, a self, an entity that creates a self-sustaining existence for the most desperately poor and homeless in the world. That being Haiti. It's a second, no, it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, second poorest country in the world behind an African nation. So to whom much is entrusted, much is required. We went to Haiti and I took the best of philanthropy. So I'm going to get to your answer about philanthropic capitalism. Mm-hmm. We know what philanthropy is. The, to me, the best part of philanthropy is the heart. The worst part is charity. So Charity exacerbates poverty. It does nothing to solve the problem. Mm. So I took the best of philanthropy, which is the heart, got rid of the worst, which is just giving money away. Look at Ethiopia. Since I was 10, Ethiopia has been suffering. Okay. And then I took the best of capitalism, which is money, and got rid of the worst, which is greed. 
I married the two together, philanthrocapitalist, philanthrocapitalism, and that's what we apply in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. 29 self-sustaining villages. One more time, 29 self-sustaining villages we have built in Haiti over the last 20 years. When I say self-sustaining, when we build a village, which is typically 50 houses, a community center, a school, a church, a clinic, renewable food, clean drinking water, and some form of free enterprise that we kind of sprinkle over the top of the village so it can be self-sustaining. We are coming back. They know we are creating this village and then we're moving on to the next. We're not there to, to like, the, the, the welfare and entitlement programs are wonderful, but the welfare and entitlement mentality is toxic. Big difference. Mm -hmm. So in Haiti, there's no programs to care for the indigent and poor. It's these small NGOs, non-government organizations like ours that goes over there. And, and Joan, we are 29 for 29, meaning all of our villages are not just surviving. They are thriving based upon this philanthrocapitalistic approach to solving poverty. And, and honestly, that, that drew me out of the depths of depression 20 some years ago because my mentor taught me. Like we talked the first half of your program about a professional highest calling, my real estate. Well, once I was able to dovetail my professional highest calling with my spiritual highest calling, providing a self-sustaining existence to the poorest of the poor in Haiti, I, I skipped over happiness and landed on joy. Like, you know, that, that hap money will do two things for you. For those of you who are tuning in just for the money part, money will do two things for you because I've experienced having none and having a lot. It will provide all the relief and comfort you can imagine. I mean, just imagine all the relief and comfort. I had it, but I had nothing in my soul. That's where that joy came in when I realized, wow, Frank, you need to, you need to act out that passage from Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is expected. Get out there and care for the people who can't care for themselves and do it in a way where they become self-sustaining. That has been my, you can see, I get so passionate about it. That has been my life's work besides the real estate for the last 20 years. And, and honestly, um, we talk about legacy. That will be my legacy, Joan. It will not be the real estate. It'll be what we've done for 13,000 kids now. 13,000 children in Haiti that were eating dirt flavored with bouillon and lemon juice are now living a self-sustaining existence. Thank you. <laughs> That is all I can say. Thank you so much. That is, that is phenomenal. 29. That is no small feat. That's a lot. You're doing a lot for the world and it's truly really appreciated. So I, I know you talked about your spiritual calling. Does everybody have one? Is everyone really called to live, to help the less privileged and do something for others, not just themselves? Yes unequivocally and again because i'm a simpleton like a linear thinker 1.8 gpa i provided housing to the world's most wealthy who really don't need it like they have houses all over the world i'm just really good at it and i love what i do that's my my professional gift from god uh if i hadn't stumbled on my spiritual highest calling which is basically i'm in the housing business for the rich and i like i get to be a modern day robin hood like i get to sell to the rich and give to the poor that's linear that's simple so I tell people, you know, look within your field of expertise for your, for your spiritual highest calling. You know, if you're a caregiver, you work at a hospital, for example, you know, spend some time visiting a, like a, a retirement home on your own time. Go to a homeless shelter, go to a soup kitchen, hmm. go, you know, they're, they're a children's cancer ward. I mean, these are things people say to me often, Joan, well, they kind of say it under their breath. <laughs> That's easy for you to say, Frank, you, you have a lot of money. You can do this kind of stuff. Well, guess what? The Bible talks about time, talent, and treasure. You don't have to have the treasure. You don't even have to have the talent. You have the time to share. I had one hour a week to go and help feed the homeless. That's all I did was one hour a week. In my spiritual book called The Tap, which is basically a, an expansion of that Luke 12, 48, God coming down, tapping you on the shoulder, calling you to more, teaching you how not to brush that off your shoulder and to answer that tap. If I hadn't listened to the tap to go out and serve meals one hour a week to the homeless, Joan, there would be no 29 villages in Haiti and 13,000 kids that are now living a self-sustaining existence. Mm -hmm. So if you take nothing else from this program, there's, 
there's a bunch of people that can teach you how to make money, you know, better than I can. I can help you get your mind right with through my book, Aspire. And the last section of that book, I save it for last. There's five chapters in that section. It's titled From Rich to Enriched. Mm. I want you in the Bible, the second only to love is money spoken about. So money, it's a good thing if used properly. I want to I want you to be rich. I mean, following Joan, you will be rich, but to the feeling of being enriched through the use be, through you being a responsible steward for the blessings you've been given is where true lasting joy and legacies are found and made. You said it beautifully <laughs> because I, I know that for a lot of us, like, but I don't have enough money. I'm, I'm barely getting uh, through life. I'm barely able to pay my bills. I'm in so much debt. I can't do anything. But you broke it down. There's time, treasure, and talent. Yeah. If, you have, if you don't have the other two, you have time. And, you know, it, it just reminded me of when, when the pandemic hit, the first thing that came to me was, how can I serve? How can I help people? So I drove around trying to find what can I do? Well, how can I help? And the, the quickest thing I saw was people who, uh, it's not, not, not like a soup kitchen, but like a uh, food bank. So they needed someone to deliver uh, food to people because now everyone was at home and in isolation. And I'm telling you, a lot of my friends were like, how can you put yourself in jeopardy? But I never felt more fulfilled in my life. Like I'm driving around in my Range Rover and going to, and people are like, oh my God, thank you so much for doing this. I felt so fulfilled. So I know what you're talking about. It wasn't about the money. At that point, I didn't even care about, it's not about the money. I may not have had money to give them, but I had time because we're all now locked inside our house and people could not even feed. So I yeah. get what you're saying. And for everyone listening today, there is always a way that you can help. An hour a week is not too much. We all have an hour. We spend 12 hours a weekend just watching binging on netflix you don't have an hour you can give yeah. an hour if you don't you have yes you know the, the, i want to i want to piggyback on what you just said because in, in that last section there's a chapter titled compassion without action is a waste of emotion compassion without action is a waste of emotion so joan you felt compassion you had two choices. You could have sat home like everybody else with COVID or, you know, that, that was in the pandemic and felt sorry for all the things where the life was passing by. Mm. But you chose to take your focus off your own issues and put them on somebody else who was suffering. That was having compassion, which a lot of us have, but taking action on it. I mean, that's that's just a beautiful th story. And, and, and I'm, again, I'm just going to throw I'm going to throw an, another Bible passage at you. That is chapter number 24 of my new book. And I, I went around the country on a pre-release tour for Aspire Gathering Information. And I asked people to share their Hebrews 13.2 story. So for those of you, again, don't tune me out if you're not into the Bible stuff. But be sure to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. That is the quote from Hebrews 13.2. So, and I asked people. Tell me a time when you've shown hospitality to a stranger and afterward or in the moment you felt like you were delivering hospitality to an angel. And the, the, that whole section of the book was written by other people, shared that whole chapter, sharing their Hebrews 13, 2 story. That gift that you got during the pandemic by going around is something that like you just it came off the top of your head because it was so impactful to you. And that's what I'm imploring your listeners and your viewers to do is, is, of course, if you're in debt and, you know, you have your life is kind of a mess right now. Take the focus just for an hour a week off of that and put it on somebody else who I guarantee you is doing worse than you. Come to Haiti with me sometime. You'll see how good you really have it. Eating dirt. Children's stomachs out to here because there's parasites in that dirt eating the lying stomach. You don't have that issue here. You could go to a food bank. You, you have welfare. You have ways out. The quickest way out of despair and, and, and um, depression and just feeling down and out is through helping others. Yeah, I agree. It really is. It'll, it'll pop you out. And, and I really hope you get my book. You, you can even fast forward to you know, read the, the last section, those five chapters, because with aspiration, you can change the world. And I've seen it happen. <laughs> yes, I, I I hope 
we're all not just inspired, but we're inspired to take action and to really, really help. Because I do believe that we all have a spiritual calling as well. And it doesn't have to be some loud voice from the heavens telling you do this great thing. You could just start with where you are, what you have, or if you have nothing, at least you have time. Serve people, serve people. We were all created to help one another. Listen, if you don't believe in the heavens and all that, you know, the, the universe speaks to people too. If you're a universe person and not a heavens person, well, the, <laughs> universe, the universe is speaking to you right now through us in this very moment. Yeah. Karma is speaking to you. Forget the dogma. We're talking about karma speaking to you. And that's why, listen, I, I, I take that stewardship very seriously. Like God rewarded me with that stewardship and it would be, it would be sinful. It would be a waste if I didn't act on that, those tap moments that we have in life. Yeah. And I, I was selfish, Joan. I was a consumerist and a materialist. And I was all about the cars and the clothes and the, you know, the restaurants and all that stuff. That is, you know, those are attachments. I, I have, I'm writing my eighth book. I'm not going to give it away, but there's a, there's a chapter in there. Savor everything, cling to nothing. Savor everything, attached to nothing. Watch how life flows like a river. Hmm. And, and, and you just kind of flow along with it. I, it's taken me 50 plus years to get there, but I love the taste of savoring all these wonderful things like this time with you. But when I'm done, I, I don't cling. I don't attach. And it's just, ah, oh, man, it's just a beautiful thing. So I don't want to get too philosophical, but that is, that's my new, my new book. Awesome. Thank you. So I have to ask with this ultra marathon thing that you do 12 times, First of all, what is it? Uh, and, and then why do you push yourself? Why do you push your body so far? So we'll use this as a metaphor for the insurmountable, the incomprehensible, and the impossible things in life. I call them the three eyes: Insurmountable, incomprehensible, and impossible. I've run what's referred to by the National Geographic as the toughest foot race in the world 12 times, finishing at seven, failing five. It's a 135-mile foot race through the Death Valley Desert in July, uh, run on blacktop pavement. So the ambient air temperature is 130, 125 degrees. The pavement can be over 200 degrees. And you're running 135 miles, I, I would say nonstop. I mean, you can stop, but there's a time limit. There's a 48 hour time limit. You're traversing three mountain ranges, you know, so you're below sea level, then you're 5,000 feet up, then you're 1,000 feet, and you end up at about 9,000 feet above sea level toughest foot race in the world according to the national geographic when i heard about that race back in 04 insurmountable incomprehensible impo impossible 135 miles in 125 degree heat non-stop on black are you kidding but others had done it wait a minute like these guys and women put on their pants just like i do maybe some are more gifted than i but I can do this. I hired a coach that got my mind right. I have a, a saying in, in my book, Aspire chapter, get the mind right and the money will follow. Well, my sport, get the mind right and the miles will follow. Mm. And in six weeks, my coach back then prepared my mind to run a hundred mile qualifying race because I had to qualify for the, the big race in the desert. Imagine that. I had never run a half marathon, but my mind, my coach got my mind right to run a hundred miles in, in less than 24 hours back then. So that Badwater Ultra Marathon is called the Badwater Ultra Marathon. You can Google it. It's fascinating. Even if you're not a runner, you can wrap your mind around insurmountable, incomprehensible, and impossible. That race is just that to most people. Only a hundred people get invited from around this year. I think there were 22 countries at the start line. I did not race this year. But Joan, what it did for me when I said yes to the insurmountable, incomprehensible, and possible my my elast the elasticity in my mind the the possibilities what has happened in my life since i pursued the impossible my designs have been fantastic the price points up to 50 million dollars these were things that probably wouldn't have been born had i not pursued something that represented the three eyes insurmountable incomprehensible and impossible and it so that's that's the the macro lesson the micro lesson is I've never felt more alive, closer to my wife, closer to my crew, because there's no aid stations. Like you, you have a crew that leapfrogs you every mile, that hydrates you. I go through 12 gallons of water in two days. I mean, that's how much you know, fluid I'm putting in. 
and I know why a lot of the Bible was written in like the most poignant moments in the Bible are about things that happen in the desert, you know, like to Moses and to Jesus, 40, you know, 40 days tempted. I know why, because I feel most alive there. So for the for the macro lesson, though, find the impossible, the insurmountable, the incomprehensible. And then fear sets in, right? Because it's just a big risk. But man, I just it, I'm coming to the end of my running career. Like I, I told you why I was late today because I was having an MRI done on my knees because they're just falling apart. But listen, when I go into that grave, I don't want have anything left in my knees. I want to use every single thing and I won't have a regret not running that race. That's for sure. Wow, that's, that's phenomenal. 12 times succeeded seven times, but you keep going, pushing it. The three eyes. I, I love that metaphor of how you could and how it has expanded your mind in every, other areas of your life as well. So I think a lot of us don't stay in the comfort zone. Don't let fear stop you. Push yourself. You, we don't know how far we can push until we try. Just push the body, push your mind. And again, I love what you said about it. It all starts with the mindset. If you can wrap your mind around it, that it's possible, because again, other people have done it, then there's a huge chance that you will succeed too. And you'll be better for it. And like we said earlier, we don't want to sit down and be regretting things that we didn't do. We want to say, yep, I, I did it. I tried. I tried it. And, and you know what? The problem today is, so, so we will spend 45 minutes or so together. There's so many things that I've thrown out there. Um, I would encourage you to re-watch this. Pull out one or two. Just one or two, because the problem with the amount of information, the over spreadsheeting, over Googling, overthinking, it becomes like it's too much, too much anxiety. Just there's too many pick. I've given seminars that were eight hours long and I told people to go home with two things, two things. And those things you want to take action on. Don't don't. I, don't try to write all this stuff down and do all. I probably threw out 25 action items. At least <laughs> pick, pick two, pick two and get going on one. Because what we, we, we build confidence by celebrating humble victories, like these tiny little humble victories. We celebrate them like triumphant achievements that builds confidence. So one or two things gets, well, two things, but get started on just one. Awesome. <laughs> so I, I think that's a good lesson because really, Frank, you have been amazing today. You've given us so many words of wisdom, so many advice, so many strategies that we can use to achieve that success or whatever, what create the new life that we want. Okay. Regardless of where you're coming from or where you've been changing your mindset, you know, going into real estate, that's what you want to do. Aspire, no longer motivation or inspire, but now we want to focus on aspire. And if you haven't seen the book, go get the book. He's put it up a couple of times. Go get the book if you really want to achieve some of the things that we're talking about today. But I think all in all, I love everything you said about the spiritual calling. I think that's an area that more people should look into. If we had more people in there, the world will definitely be a better place for everyone. Uh, but also I love your final message on, we've thrown a lot of things at you. Remember to and act on one. One. And if I could spend a minute to make that one thing easier for the people that are going to take that advice and do it, go to the aspirebook.com, the aspirebook.com. On that site, there, there's a sample chapter. If for those of you who don't like to read, I narrated that entire book on Audible. So it's my voice. It's not even me reading to you. I'm, it's almost like I'm free associating, having a discussion with you. I riff, I go off the script. <laughs> there's a sample, there's a sample audible chapter on there too. There's um, reviews. There's, there's all sorts of things. So go there, get familiar with it. Mm -hmm. If you like what you see, yeah, go to Amazon, and get it or go buy it. from. If you buy it from us, I autograph it and I send it to you. And if you do get it from us, Every copy of Aspire that we sell, and even if you buy from Amazon, but I just, we make a little less money. Every copy that, uh, that we sell of Aspire, through us at least, provides 200 meals in one of our orphanages in Haiti. I made my money in real estate. I make no money from my book sales. So think about that. One freaking book is 200 meals in Haiti. If you buy it from Amazon, we, we, we're, we're, about to, we're able to do about 40 or 50 meals, but still. Buy it from Amazon. I don't care. It's something. Yes. And, and it also will help you take action. There's 300 some pages broken out of these five, these five sections. It will, take, it will help you take action on that one thing that you, the two things, but the one that you choose to take action on tomorrow.
amazing. <laughs> so again, it's the aspirebook.com and you can get that free sample chapter and a voice narration by Frank himself from yeah. Audible so that you can go ahead and buy that book. And again, I just love that each book can feed two, 200 meals. That's a lot. 200 so meals. Thinking about a way of how to do more, how to find that spiritual calling and start taking action and not just having compassion. Well, here is a big opportunity. Just buy the book that's going to change your life, but it's also going to help 200, uh, feed 200, provide 200 meals for people in Haiti. I think that is phenomenal. Thank you. I so say it any better. I could not. <laughs> that's right. That covers all the bases. They took action. They helped somebody else. And you're going to benefit. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's just, uh, well, you'll see. You go there, read the reviews, and exactly, yeah. it, it's done. It's done really well because, listen, we all want to aspire. We want to create our own reality and not have somebody create it for us, and in turn alter that DNA. Right? That's another way of saying kill the person you were born to be to become the person you want to be. Love it. So, just the final question now for you, Frank, because you seem to have done it all. What's next? <laughs> Well, I retired from real estate for two and a half years. And if you go to my website uh, or my YouTube channel, I just announced I was coming back to, to real estate, but not in Florida. Okay. I, if, if there was anything to get me excited, like it would be colonizing the moon, right? Like I want to go somewhere where n nobody's really found the, the, the three uns in, in, in real estate, undiscovered, undervalued, underappreciated. Well, we found a little place, a little town in, in North, Carolina, North Carolina, Canton, North Carolina, that, that we are going to colonize, basically. I mean, it's colonized, but there is opportunity there like I've never seen before. So I am coming back. We actually made a movie about, about it that premiered at the movie theater just on July 7th. I have a contract with the movie theater that says I can't put the movie out for free, which I'm going to do. It's only it's a short movie. It's like 10 minutes long. Uh on August 11th, because I have to, or August 7th, I got to wait 30 days. So that's next. I mean, that I'm, I'm eager to come back and do this in a fashion is almost like colonizing the moon. Caring House continues on in Haiti. Um, we've just sold the house that we've lived in for 25 years. So moving up to another market will be, it'll be very interesting. That's, that's what's next professionally, you know, spiritually, um, you know, I mean, the, the moon shot would be, I love that country of Haiti so much. I love the people so much. I, I think I could do a good job as ambassador to Haiti. So I throw that out there to the universe, to, you know, to, to, to God that at some point, you know, philanthropic capitalism would be a wonderful way to solve the problem of problems of that, of that poor country. So I've seen it happen in 29 villages. Why couldn't it happen in the whole country? That's the big, that's the big moon shot. <laughs> Amazing. Hmm. Lots of exciting things coming up, Frank. Well, thank you very much for being here with us today. So many words of wisdom, so many nuggets here today. You have really impacted the world in your own way. You're doing a great job. So I want to say thank you for all that you do. Thank you for, for the, all the books you've written, Changing Lives. We do appreciate you being here with us and sharing everything that you've shared. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all my listeners for listening. I hope you really enjoyed today's episode. I definitely did. Uh, you picked your two things and one thing you're going to action. And don't forget to visit that website, theaspirebook.com to get your free chapter so that you can start creating the new reality that you want, not the one that was created for you. Thank you for being here with us. And I will see you all same time next week on iRise Conversations with Joan. Thanks. Bye, everybody.